Hi, my name is Patrick Hawkins. I'm a professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering at the University of Virginia, and I'm also the deputy director of the UVA MIST Center. So today I'm going to talk about nanoscale heat transfer and how nanoscale heat transfer impacts the thermal properties of materials and performance of devices. So to start, I thought we could talk about the characteristic time and length scales of thermal transport. What we typically think of as engineers and scientists and what we're typically first taught is bulk heat conduction, which is what, for the purpose of this talk, what we're gonna consider at the macro scale. Bulk heat conduction, as we'll see in the following slides, is dictated by the Fourier law. And really, when we talk about bulk heat conduction, we're dealing with scales on the, on the order of tens to hundreds of microns to even millimeters. So materials that, what we call bulk, will be materials that are on the order of tens of microns, hundreds of microns, millimeters. These would be packages in heat sinks. When you start to transition to the length scale that we're considering nanoscale heat transfer is when you start to have to consider individual carrier effects on thermal transport. So what I'm showing here are a plethora of applications that are dictated by nanoscale heat transfer processes. Once you get down to length scales that are on the order of a micron or less and time scales that are on the order of nanoseconds or less, that's when you have to start considering all of the individual energy carriers and how those individual energy carriers, such as electrons and phonons, impact your thermal transport. So ultimately, heat conduction in several devices and several applications are dictated by individual electron and phonon scattering events, which is really when we talk about electron and phonon scattering events, we're talking about the 10 nanometer, 100 nanometer length scale and picoseconds to nanoseconds. Okay, so the property that we're most concerned about for the purpose of this talk is the, is the heat transfer property thermal conductivity. So from a um, bulk heat transfer perspective, the thermal conductivity is defined by the Fourier law, where the Fourier law tells you that the heat flux through a material is related to the temperature gradient through its thermal conductivity. So in steady state, a typical picture that you would see for heat conduction in a material is a linear temperature gradient. We have a hot side, a cold side, and the rate in which heat is flowing and establishing this temperature gradient is dictated by the thermal conductivity. Now, the thermal conductivity is very material dependent. So here I'm showing a plot of the thermal conductivity as a function of atomic density of just some textbook materials that you'd find in the back of any handbook. Of course, one of the highest thermal conductors known to man, naturally occurring known to man, is diamond, thermal conductivity above 2000 watts per meter Kelvin. Then you have a lot of metals and high thermal conductivity semiconductors. Of course, copper is ubiquitously used as heat sinks in electronic devices because of its high thermal conductivity. Aluminum, silicon, you know, one of the most widely used semiconductors in its bulk form has a relatively high thermal conductivity. But you'll notice that the thermal conductivity generally decreases as you decrease the density. Also, if we start to talk about materials that are not crystals but are disordered like window glass, that can have very low thermal conductivities, which we'll talk about a little more later because the disordered nature of that structure leads to low thermal conductivities. And then of course you get to this regime where we're considering insulations and porous materials, very, very low atomic densities. So you start to approach the thermal conductivity of air in a solid. So this is maybe the macroscopic way to think about thermal conductivity. You think about macroscopic in the sense that we define things from the Fourier law and macroscopic in the sense that really what we're considering here is just by making something less dense or having a very porous insulation, you can get low thermal conductivities. But from a nanoscale perspective, there are different considerations that we need to have. So in the microscopic picture of thermal conductivity, we go back to that picture I had in the very first slide about the characteristic times and length scales of thermal conduction. And when you start to consider electrons and phonons and their individual interactions with each other and how far a thermal carrier will travel before it scatters and loses energy or momentum with another, with another particle or another uh, aspect of the material, that's when you, start, that's when you st start to consider thinking about thermal conductivity of, in more of a nanoscopic picture. So you consider the mean free path of the carriers in the material. And here, when we, when we consider things in this way, we start to understand the nanostructure of the material and how that material would influence the thermal conductivity through scattering. So a nanoscopic way to consider the thermal conductivity of materials is not the phenomenological Fourier law, but in fact, this kinetic theory expression, where the kinetic theory expression says that the thermal conductivity of materials is equal to a combination of the heat capacity, so this is the amount of energy that can be stored in the material, the velocity of the carriers is how fast it moves, 
and then the mean free path. So this is the distance that a carrier will move before it scatters and loses energy. So in effect, if you zoom in on that temperature gradient that I showed on the last slide, what you see is a lot of individual scattering events for energy to get from this side of the material to this side of the material. And each one of those individual scattering events is causing that particle, that electron or that phonon to lose energy. So when we start to consider the nanoscopic picture materials, that's when you kind of get, you have different trends that emerge. For example, you would start to see materials such as carbon buckyballs, still a carbon allotrope, right? Just like diamond, diamonds made of carbon. Well, buckyballs are made of carbon, but now they're arranged in a different way where now your carbon buckyball, your C60 is covalently bonded and it's very weakly interacting with another C60 that's next to it. So you basically have these large, large atomic crystals that don't wanna interact with each other. They basically, the mean free path becomes on the order of the atomic spacing, even though you still have a crystalline carbon material. So these are the types of considerations that one must have when you're considering the thermal conductivity of material and engineering the thermal conductivity of material and what can change the thermal conductivity of materials. So let's dig a little more into this. Now, to consider the nanoscopic picture of thermal conductivity, we have to consider what transfers heat. In a metal, a metals, are, metals are very electrically conducted. This is why we always use copper wire. And in metals, electrons carry the majority of the heat. Electrons are the primary energy carrier in metals. So when we talk about the thermal conductivity of, say, copper, the thermal conductivity of copper is driven by the electrons in the copper. And the electrons in the copper will travel a certain distance and lose their energy based on other collisions with electrons or, other, or collisions with atoms in the crystalline lattice or phonons. Phonons are quantized vibration of a crystalline lattice and electrons can scatter with phonons, th thus dictating the thermal conductivity of metals. Where we will be primarily talking in, in the remainder of this talk is we'll focus on materials in which phonon propagation is the primary energy carrier. So in semiconductors and insulators that do not have free electrons, the primary heat carrier are phonons. Phonons are quantized lattice vibrations. So in a crystal material, which has a lattice plus an atomic basis, that lattice can oscillate with coupled energy and the quantized vibration of that energy is called a phonon. The speed of phonons is on the order of the speed of sound. In fact, this is where the concept of phonon came from with the root being sound, phone, and phonons, the long wavelength phonons are actually traveling at the speed of sound in the material. So when we start to a first approximation, when we start talking about the kinetic theory expression that we showed in the previous slide, if we start talking about the thermal conductivity of phonons, then we'd say that the thermal conductivity is related to the heat capacity of the phonons, the velocity of the phonons, again, roughly the speed of sound, um, or max the speed of sound, and then the mean free path of these phonons. So what would dictate the thermal conductivity of crystalline nonmetals in which phonons are the primary heat carrier. And to that, we can consider this following example with the data on the left shown just from a summary of the literature of the thermal conductivity of different types of silicon, silicon thin films or silicon germanium alloys. So what I mean by different types is we have, uh, we have nanowires, we have films, we have super lattices, all these different kinds of silicon nanostructure or silicon material, and how do, the, how do the dopants or the interfaces impact the thermal conductivity? For reference, this is the thermal conductivity of bulk silicon. The thermal conductivity of bulk silicon, it's an intrinsic value to silicon. It's, ex, it's intrinsic to something called the silicon dispersion curve. So this is the phonon dispersion curve of silicon. What this, that the phonon dispersion curve of silicon tells you are the allowable energies and velocities of phonons in silicon. You'll notice, there's a set bandwidth of phonons in silicon, and the derivative of this curve is the speed of the phonons, where the energy of the phonons is given by the frequency. So we now have basically two thirds of this expression of thermal conductivity that we can just get from the phonon dispersion curve. The final piece, or the mean free path, is related to the different types of impurities or interfaces that are found in the silicon material or in the silicon structure. And the rule of thumb is pretty much anything that causes a crystalline non-ideality will scatter a phonon. So for example, let's say we have something considered a dilute alloy where we have less than 1% of germanium in a silicon matrix. Even with just 1% germanium in a silicon matrix, the thermal conductivity of this silicon germanium composite drops by a factor of five. 
thermal conductivity at room temperature of silicon is 150. The thermal conductivity uh, of room temperature of silicon with 1% germanium is 30. We can go even further and now start to put a large percentage of alloy atoms, a large percentage of germanium in a silicon germanium alloy. Thermal conductivity drops from silicon by over an order of magnitude. Then we can go even further and start to create super lattices with multiple interfaces. Or we can create super lattice with multiple interfaces and quantum dots at the interface. Thermal conductivity keeps driving down and it drives down roughly to this lower bound here, which is on the order of about one watt per meter Kelvin, which is what amorphous silicon is, the limit of complete disorder, which we often consider roughly the lower limit to thermal conductivity. Okay, so what dictates the thermal conductivity of solids? The phonon dispersion curve, which tells us the energy and the velocity, and then the scattering length. And anything will affect the scattering length, dopant atoms, interfaces, and impurities. Now, in general, when we can consider the thermal conductivity of materials, across the board, to understand what dictates the thermal conductivity of materials, we can look at a wide range of, of semiconducting materials of non-metals, so that would be shown in the blue here. And to a first approximation, we can now understand how to make a higher or lower thermal conductivity based on nanoscale material properties. So here I'm showing a plot of the thermal conductivity versus elastic modulus of just a wide range of materials. Notice again, diamond is the highest highest thermal conductivity material naturally occurring to man. Diamond is also the stiffest material. So of course, diamond is a very, very strong material. And when you have very strong bonds, you have very high thermal conductivities. That allows a very high speed of phonon propagation. When you have a very soft material, such as a polymer or these C60s we talked about, um, a, a weaker van der Waal type material, van der Waal bonded material, um, that leads to a very low strength, a low modulus, and a very low thermal conductivity. So now how would you manipulate the thermal conductivity of materials? Let's say you have a stiff material, but you wanna drive down the thermal conductivity. Well, we saw on the last slide, one way that you can do it is by introducing defects, introducing interfaces. This is this concept of having a very um, multi-principle element alloy or high entropy alloy, where you could have a lot of different types of atoms in a single crystal. And now you don't sacrifice the mechanical properties as much, but you can drive down the thermal conductivity. So there's a lot of tricks that you can play um, with nanoscale engineering to move up and down the thermal conductivity curve. So where I wanna talk for the rest of the talk are the implications of defects and interfaces on the, not only the thermal conductivity of materials, but the thermal processes or the thermal management of devices. Okay, so what I'm showing here is a balanced photodiode, a high frequency, high power balanced photodiode um, that's made at UVA by uh, Professor Joe Campbell. So this is a collaboration that Joe Campbell and I, another missed um, UVA faculty had where Joe is trying to make the world's greatest, most powerful, highest frequency photodiode. Now the problem is, as you push to higher power, you generate more heat and you need to get rid of that heat. So currently, if you were to look at one of his photodiodes, then you have an active region where all the heat's being generated and you need to get heat out of that active region and cooled into some heat sink, into some sub mount. And the more heat you can get out of the active region, then, or the absorbing region here, the more heat you can get out, then the more, the higher power you can handle in this device. And ultimately, at the end of the day, for this particular application, you want a high power density. You want to have as high a power as possible and an ultra fast photodiode. So one logical approach that many people can and will and should take is to say what we'll do is we'll take the thermal conductivity of the, we'll, we'll change the substrate that we're mounting this photodiode on and change it so it has a very high thermal conductivity. Okay, we saw on the last slide, what has some of the highest thermal conductivities? Diamond. So the thought is if we were to measure the power density at failure of this device, which is basically the volts, the volts, per, the volts amps generated per centimeter squared. So this is the power generated per centimeter squared. This is the power density at failure at the point where the device fails. We wanna maximize this number because that means we can drive up the power of the device. So to maximize that number, one thought is let's just put it on higher and higher thermal conductivities. Okay, so starting point for a lot of technologies to do this on silicon, it's ubiquitous, it's easy, you can, you can etch, you can do everything with silicon. Silicon has a, thermal, has a literature thermal conductivity of about 150, power density of failure is a little over 100. 
So then the thought is, okay, let's move it to aluminum nitride. Aluminum nitride has a literature value thermal conductivity of about 300 literature value. I'll come back to that later. And okay, so you increase the thermal conductivity by a factor two of the heat sink um, and you increase the power density of failure by not really a factor two, a little less than that. Um, actually much less than that. So not that impressive. And where it becomes even more striking in that the thermal conductivity is not driving the performance is now let's go to diamond. Now let's take the thermal conductivity of diamond an order of magnitude higher than the thermal conductivity of silicon. However, the power density of failure only increases by a modest factor of two. So an order of magnitude higher thermal conductivity of the heat sink, if everything were working the way we thought it should work, then the temperature of the device should be an order of magnitude lower and you could have an order of magnitude higher power density. That's clearly not the case. So what could be happening? Well, let's go back to what we remembered and what we think about with the thermal conductivity of materials. Okay, what can be impacting the thermal conductivity of materials? Let's just do a survey of this. So here I'm showing the thermal conductivity of gallium nitride plotted as a function of thickness. And in addition to plotting as a function of thickness, you also see these contour lines where these lines represent um, the impact of different dislocation density. So defects in the crystalline lattice. Uh, what you're seeing here is that this is, this is results from a work from a few years ago. These um, solid data points are original um, data points that we measured in this work. The hollow data points are data that we surveyed from the literature. Okay, so there's probably what, 50 or so data points in here. And I think what you'll find is that if you go to someone and say, I'd like to know the thermal conductivity of gallium nitride, there's not one number. Because to answer that question properly, I have to know the dislocation density. I need to know the defect density. I need to know the thickness of the gallium nitride. All those things, even though they don't impact the phonon dispersion necessarily of the gallium nitride, the C or the B, they will impact the scattering like scale of the gallium nitride. And when does this become important? When you start to see a major drop off in thermal conductivity, when you start to get to the less than 10 micron regime. Remember back in the first slide, characteristic time and length scales. Getting down to the one to 10 micron regime is when you start to see a reduction in thermal conductivity due to size effects. And then of course you have a tremendous impact on density or on uh, defect effects. Okay, so how does that, could that be an answer of why the thermal conductivity, the power density of failure of our devices were not performing the way we thought they were. So we went and we measured the precise substrates that we were using to make this photodiode. And one thing you see here is these data points labeled device are our measurements on the precise wafer that we use to make the device out of. What I'm plotting here is the measured thermal conductivity on a range of substrates plot as a function of literature thermal conductivity. So first of all, if we get silicon from a reliable vendor from where we know what the, we know it's high quality silicon, the thermal conductivity is exactly what it should be, exactly what the literature value says it is. But depending on where we're getting the silicon and what's unknown about the microstructure of the defects, the thermal conductivity is lower. Same thing with the aluminum nitride that, that we were using. You can get much higher quality aluminum nitride that can be much closer to theoretical literature value. Now, same thing with the diamond, but it does turn out that the diamond that we used for this device was pretty close to, to literature. Okay, so let's go back to that plot, power density of failure versus thermal conductivity. So here I'm showing power density of failure versus thermal conductivity. The red is showing the literature values. This, the red is the data point from two slides ago, just using values that we would pluck from the handbook in the literature and say, we're not gonna measure the submount, we're just assuming the thermal conductivity is this. That's what's shown in the red. Um, but when we measure the thermal conductivity, you see a shift in the curve because the thermal conductivities of this substrate, of the actual substrate we used is actually lower than what we measured, except during the diamond case. However, we still don't see a one-to-one -one trend. This still does not make sense. So what this says is regardless of whether we use a real or assumed value for thermal conductivity, the thermal conductivity of the submount is not dictating the, the power density at failure and the ultimate performance of this photodiode. So what else could be happening? Well, and with this comes the concept of a thermal boundary resistance. So a thermal boundary resistance it, or a thermal boundary conductance, which is the inverse, is a property that relates the heat flux across an interface between two materials. So mathematically, the heat flux across material one to material two and is related to the temperature drop across those two materials across the interface through the thermal boundary conductance or the inverse of which is the thermal boundary resistance. Now, we know that the thermal boundary resistance plays a role in a wide array of technologies. Just to name a few shown here, 
laser technologies, light emitting diodes, memory devices, uh, high power electronic devices, computing and logic devices, nanoparticles for biology and photothermal therapy, energy recovery devices. Pretty much this thermal boundary resistance will be a dominant thermal resistance in materials that have length scales on the order of, where the characteristic length scale of the material is on the order of the electron or phonon mean free path. Remember the one to 10 microns and below. Once, you're, once you hit the one to 10 microns and below, you can start to see thermal boundary resistance effects. And especially if we consider things like quantum cascade lasers with super lattices that have periodicities on the order of say a couple of nanometers, phase change memory devices that are trying to be pushed to the 10 nanometer length scale. Computing, we're trying to push to the, you know, the, the single atom transistor. Everything's gonna be an interface and we have to consider this thermal boundary resistance. So let's put some numbers to thermal boundary resistance. So here I'm showing a plot of the thermal boundary resistance as a function of temperature for a wide range of interfaces. So for example, if you put two metals in contact and you take great care to make sure there's no oxide layer at the metal, uh, at the metal metal interface, and it's a perfectly as crystalline interface as you can get, you have very, very high thermal boundary conductances, very low resistances. To put this into perspective, these lines are showing equivalent conductances of a certain thickness of silicon dioxide. Okay, so what's that mean? That means for an aluminum copper interface at room temperature, the thermal boundary conductance, the resistance of that interface poses just about as much resistance as less than a nanometer of silicon dioxide. That's not that big a deal. Okay, but now let's talk about metal non-metal interfaces, like a metal silicon interface, shown in the black here. This metal silicon interface poses a thermal boundary resist, uh, a conductance of about 100 to 200 megawatts per meter squared Kelvin. It's a similar unit to a convection coefficient. It's a surface conductance. <clears throat> okay, what's that mean? That means that this is providing as much thermal resistance as 10 nanometers of SiO2. So when we start thinking about uh, nanoscale devices, nanoscale computing devices that are relying on 10 nanometers or less of silicon in contact with metals for their um, source drains and gates, you have more resistance at the metal silicon interface then you do the entire size of the material or potentially the entire or a, par a portion of the thickness of the gate oxide. And not only that, but the structure and chemistry of the interface can play a major role. So for example, if there's roughness at the aluminum silicon interface, the thermal conductance drops by a factor of two, the resistance goes up by a factor of two. If you have bonding, like in this example, the green triangles, which was aluminum on graphene, if you're able to increase the bond strength from aluminum directly on graphene to now aluminum on oxygen functionalized graphene, the conductance increases by a factor of two, conductance or resistance reduces by a factor of two due to that increased bonding. Mm -hmm. Similar thing we found with dislocations. Dislocations can impact the thermal boundary resistance. Now, what dictates the thermal boundary resistance? Uh, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to the phonon dispersion and the phonon spectrum. And if you have two materials in contact that have totally different phononic spectrum, you have a large resistance. This is the exact equivalent to impedance matching in electronics. We now talk about thermal impedance matching in phononics. And matching the phonon impedance of materials comprising an interface can lead to larger conductances. But if you have highly mismatched materials, then you can have very low conductances and large resistances. So if you have materials in contact where one of the materials has a very, very, very wide phonon spectrum, which would happen if you have a very stiff material, very strong material would have a large phonon bandwidth, such as diamond, then you end up with a large phonon mismatch and a very low conductance. And it's very interesting to note that the lowest thermal boundary conductance ever measured between two materials at room temperature <coughs> is between two three-dimensional materials at room temperature, I should say, um, is at the bismuth diamond interface. So diamond interfaces pose the largest thermal resistance because of the phononic mismatch. So what's that mean for our device? Let's go back to that high power, high frequency photodiode. So now we plot power density failure versus substrate thermal conductivity. That's shown in the red, same trend we saw. <clears throat> now we can do this a couple different ways and, and it'll become clear in the next slide where we plot it in a, in a more logical way. But I, wanna I just wanna show it on this plot because now we can look at thermal boundary conductance as a function of substrate thermal conductivity. You could see a similar trend to what we see with power density failure. But 
if you were to connect the dots and say, look, the power density at failure trends the same with substrate thermal conductivity as the thermal boundary conductance trends. So what's that mean? Well, now let's plot the power density at failure as a function of thermal boundary conductance for the three devices that we measured. And now we see a one-to-one -one scaling between the, thermal, the power density at failure and the thermal boundary conductance, where the power density at failure goes up by not even the factor of two from silicon to diamond, but that's because the thermal boundary conductance only goes up by a factor of two. It doesn't matter that the diamond has an order of magnitude thermal conductivity. Ultimately, the interfaces are thermally limiting the device. TBC or thermal boundary conductance plays a direct role in power density at failure. So I, I hope you enjoyed this lecture as much as I enjoyed giving it. Um, I'd just like to leave by thanking NSF and the MIST Center and just um, reiterating that nanoscale heat transfer plays a direct and powerful role in device performance and nanoscale interfaces can be thermally limiting in your circuit.